Welcome everybody as folks um, continue to jump in. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to our CLAG's news unveiling, um, an archival unveiling um, from the scholarly record, no, from the archives and scholarly record. I don't exactly remember the name of our, <laughs> of our presentation, but let me just say welcome. Um, oops, that's not what I wanted that to do. So let's go back in and there we go. So I'm Shonda Smith-Cruz. I'm the co-chair of uh, the CLAGS board. Um, I also no longer work at the Graduate Center. I work at NYU Libraries as an associate dean, but I'm so happy to return to CUNY and be here to represent CLAGS to get us started in this journey of um, unveiling this amazing collection and celebrating the unveiling of this archive. Before I do, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that we are all gathered in various places, states, locales, likely on unceded territories. And though um, I, as well as CLAGS, are located in the unceded land of the Lenape territories, I'm also in the Wappinger territories, I live in Connecticut, um, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape and Wappinger community and as well as your own. Um, and the elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Because as CLAGS moves into this time to acknowledge our own history, we are in our anniversary year, and we, we bring in our own archival memory, we must also acknowledge much of all that we consume and celebrate was founded atop exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those of whom this land and this institution the institution for which this land is on is located. So with the CLAGS News Archive, I also bring its subjects of LGBT communities, including this image that I love and constantly use, which is of a circle for the Rivers of Honey Cabaret at the Wild Cafe Theater, um, where a collection of hands of intergenerational queer women of color bring into the space their grandmothers, our ancestors, and this collective acknowledgement of the ongoing le legacies of settler colonialism. So I wanted to bring us into this space with our ancestral connection and with our um, continual acknowledgement. So thank you for joining me and us. So to begin, I wanted to acknowledge that the CLAGS archive is an institutional archive. It's located inside of the CLAGS office. So that means we don't say have it at the New York Public Library or in a, a community archive like Lesbian Herster Archive is actually located within the space. And since 1991, it's been capturing and, and retaining its documents and records to include many different formats, including thousands of hours of video or hundreds of hours of video, uh, audio tapes, posters, flyers and events. We have so much inside of the CLAGS archive. And I also wanna thank the members of the CLAGS archive committee, um, including Jamie Sharon Cohn, who I saw just came in um, to help to continue to preserve and think through how we can uh, use this archive going forward and promote its contents. Some of the contents are located in the digital, the CUNY Digital History Archive. So I wanted to put a nod to that and that they have already been showcasing some of our videos and, and our content through their, their platform. But today, although we have all of this content, the CLAGS newsletter, which is called CLAGS News is what we're highlighting today. So this is a very small component of a larger archive. So I just wanted to, you know, show, you know, give, uh, breath to the scale of the archives so that we can acknowledge which part of it we're looking to. So the CLAGS News uh, Archive or Repository Project, which is what I just named it today, but I don't think it had a formal name, um, is really a collaboration of the CLAGS uh, organization and the CUNY Graduate Center Library. And so I wanted to just um, acknowledge the contributors to this project and give some definition to what is located within CLAGS News, just to give an overview, but we're gonna go into some of these going forward. The CLAGS News archive consists, exists um, as a newsletter. It, it holds articles, editorials, announcements, briefings, letters from almost 200 leading queer scholars from Judith Butler, John D'Amelio, Jose Munoz, Anne Svekovich, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, Martin Duberman, and so many others, and Marcia Gall, who's about to approach the room, so she didn't even hear her name called. Um, <laughs> and so many others. We really just have a large mass content from 1991 till today of material that came through this first 
uh, LGBT research center in the country. Some examples of that are the first ever queer disabilities conference held at San Francisco State University in 2002, or uh, in 2004, Alyssa Solomon, one of our executive directors, created a committee of queer disability rights activists, disability studies scholars, and queer studies scholars and activists. We also had the first academic conference to explore economic as aspects of the LGBT community called Homo Economics in 1994, or Black Nation, Queer Nation, a 1995 spotlight on Black feminism as a catalyst for change, heterosexism of, of Black scholarship, growing up queer in the, Black, in the African diaspora. And then a final example is the emergence of transgender studies. Um, there was a 2005 conference, Transpolitics, Social Change and Justice, and it was remembered by one participant who contributed to this newsletter um, as the real lives of trans people were being addressed by trans people. And that was sort of, these are just components of what you'll find inside of the archive. Some things that um, happened over, I would say more than five years is we had an archival exhibition in 2018 called Thousand Ghostly She is a History of Queer Studies, um, which Elvis Bakaitis and Catherine Pratt, who were two librarians at the Graduate Center Library uh, presented and Elvis will remark on that later. We had a mass digitization project because the archive was not in digital, for, uh, the newsletter was in print form mostly. So we brought in some interns from Queens College School of Library Information Science, Catherine Jedlicka and Mary Beth Kosha Wais, who contributed to a large digitization for this collection. We also brought in uh, additional staff to contact authors. So if you were on this call, you probably got an email from Sadie Rainhope Dunn or Kate Angel who were working diligently to contact uh, individual authors and ask specifically for your signature to put this material into the repository. And I also wanna thank and acknowledge the leadership at the CUNY Graduate Center Library who really saw this as a priority and, and saw that this was something that needed to happen within the, re the repository, but also in the library work. And that includes Polly Thistlewaite, Jill Saracella, Emily Drabinsky, and Megan Wacha, who are all really uh, large components of this project. So I'm just very excited and thankful to everyone who continued this forward. And I'm, I'm excited to introduce it to everyone here. So to bring us further in, I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Justin T. Brown, who is our current executive director of CLAGS and associate professor of health sciences at LaGuardia Community College. Hi, Justin. Sorry about that. I was. <laughs> um, hello, Sean, and um, and everyone else um, that has joined us this afternoon. Um, I want to thank all of you for being able to come to such an importantly critical event. Um, and for this wonderful unveiling of a uh, significant initiative around the CLAGS News Archive. Um, as many of you know, and as uh, Sean did mention as well, uh, the Center for LGBT, LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, was officially founded right as part of the CUNY system in 1991. However, it did nearly begin five years earlier in the home of our founding director, Martin Duberman. Through the efforts of Martin and our four parents um, that they put forth, this is what allowed for the creation of a space that is truly committed to focusing on the identified needs and concerns of the LGBT plus community. As such, CLAGS is the oldest university-based research center focused on addressing issues for and by our community through a number of different activities, including free open access public programming, educational training to matriculated graduate students, as well as various fellowships and awards honoring scholars that, that span diverse spaces and locations. And we continue to strive to lift the voices of our community members through these number of avenues. At times, it is still unbelievable, right, that we continue to do so much of this work for free or with limited funding to support these activities. I wanna thank and congratulate the team again for working on this project for their tireless efforts and dedication to making certain that we honor our socio-historical context and preserve critical voices that feed the souls of many generations, as well as serve as the foundation that has allowed for us to be able to do this important work today. Moving beyond the project, the CLAGS archives continues to be a centerpiece that anchors us and our work at CLAGS as beautifully um, presented and discussed by Sean. 
We continue to work on a number of other ventures that continue in this vein, including uh, the continuation of the digitizing of the historical documents, films, and other artifacts, working as part of a collaborative project that's in its beginning stages that continues with an archival component that's in collaboration with the Public Science Project at the Center for Humanities, Women and Gender Studies Women's Center, of both of which are at the Graduate Center, which is supported by the Times Up Foundation. Additionally, as we move into our anniversary year activities and these continue to develop, we will um, also be doing a multitude of various activities, and one of which is a preservation project, archival-based project, um, that it was initially initiated, it created, spearheaded, and will be continued to be supported by our founding director, Martin Duberman. And it's um, in its early stages, but we look forward to what that holds in, for us in, uh, in the future as we continue in this important line of work. So continue to be on the lookout for that as much more is to come. And so at this time, I would like to pass it over and introduce former executive director of CLAGS from 2007 to 2011, Dr. Sarah Chin. Hi everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this event. Although I left CLAGS as executive director 10 years ago, I'm still very proud of what CLAGS has been achieving from its beginnings until now. CLAGS has always had a close relationship with CUNY in many ways. Most obviously, executive directors are always CUNY faculty, but it's more than that. Like CUNY, CLAGS believes in scholarship that is open and accessible to all and is dedicated to nurturing research that can expand not just what we know, but how we understand the world around us. And I would add, like CUNY, CLAGS has been operating on a shoestring from its very inception. My tenure as executive director spanned from 2007 to 2011, and I was proud to inherit some terrific programs and initiate others. One huge project that began under Paisley Carr's directorship was the International Resource Network, an endeavor that spanned continents. The IRN was a network of sexuality scholars across the world. It spawned a journal in Africa and a set of working papers from scholars, journalists, activists, and artists in Latin America and the Caribbean. I was also part of Starting Up Out History, a still vibrant internet resource for queer and trans history. Not only did we gather historical materials from a variety of contributors, we sponsored prizes for historians to create exhibits on the site that delved in depth into an aspect of queer history. One exciting part of being ED at CLAGS was not being able to predict what initiatives would come to us out of the blue via email or phone or from someone walking through the door. By chance, for example, I met Perry Brass, one of the early members of GLF, who wanted to scan his archive of Come Out, which is with an exclamation mark, uh, one of the first newspapers of gay liberation. We were able to upload that electronic archive to Out History, where it is, as far as I know, the only place that the whole run of the paper is available online. And it was through Perry that Clags got involved in the Rainbow Book Fair, the largest book expo in the world for LGBT readers and writers. So the largest project by far that I was involved in uh, on home base uh, was our Lesbians in the 70s conference, which brought hundreds of people, many of them women who had lived through that passionate, thrilling and explosive time in lesbian politics and culture. It was thrilling and challenging, but it's not by chance that people are still talking about it today. The conference reminded me at least of Clags's role in studying not just our cultures, I'm sorry, of not just studying our cultures, but also creating and recreating them. And all of this was communicated to CLAGS members by CLAGS News, whose archive we're celebrating today. The newsletter both announced upcoming events and reported on past activities, but it was also a way to communicate to a larger audience, many of whom live far outside of New York and were usually, usually unable to attend our events, the intellectual vibrancy that is the hallmark of CLAGS's work. It reminded our members, and not to mention our larger donors, what their financial contributions to CLAGS meant in concrete terms, the construction and maintenance of a community of scholars and thinkers who together were building what LGBT studies was and could be. Writing the ED's letter for each issue forced me to think about how our work connected to the field and with the world, 
how LGBT studies spoke to the present moment. It's cheering indeed to see CLAGS in such good hands today, continuing even in the face of this pandemic, the work of queer and trans studies for everyone. And I'm grateful to these amazing librarians and archivists that CLAGS News will be available to all to chronicle the past and the future of this remarkable organization. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah and Justin, for bringing us into the CLAGS realm. I'm so excited to now introduce our librarians. I'm biased because I too am a librarian and I used to work with Jill Saracella, who was my direct supervisor when I was at the Graduate Center. Jill Saracella is our Associate Librarian for Scholarly Communication at the Graduate Center and really was the backbone for why CUNY has academic works, although she's modest and would never admit it. Um, so I'm excited to have our librarians walk you through what the CLAGS news archive looks like within the repository of academic work. So Jill, I will pass it to you and then you can go ahead and introduce um, the other librarians. Thanks, sounds good. So at this point, you might be thinking CLAGS news is where? And Sean, if you could go to the next slide. And the answer is that the online digital archive of CLAGS news articles lives in CUNY academic works. In the language of librarians, academic works is CUNY's institutional repository, but in more plain language, it's a database where we collect and provide long-term cost-free access to the scholarly, creative, and pedagogical works of the CUNY community. More specifically, academic works includes materials ranging from faculty publications and faculty created open educational resources to student theses and dissertations to publications from CUNY centers and institutes. And centers and institutes with publications in CUNY academic works include the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies, also known as CLACLES, the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, the CUNY Mexican Studies Institute, and now, Clags. Next slide. And here on the left is a screenshot of what the Clags news section of academic works looks like. But you might be thinking, are many people really going to come come to academic works to browse? And you're right, very few people do that. The vast, vast majority of folks come to items in academic works via Google and Google Scholar searches. And indeed, that's one of the great benefits of academic works, each item in it is accompanied by a record that provides structured and tagged information about what that item is. And this is what makes the works highly discoverable in Google and Google Scholar. And indeed, over here on the right, you can see a bunch of CLAGS news articles appearing in a Google Scholar search. Next slide. Now I'm gonna give you a peek inside librarians' minds so you can see how we work in order to make the CLAGS news collection work. And here I have to give thanks to Megan Wacha, the scholarly communications librarian at CUNY's Office of Library Services, whose keen mind helped show us the way on many questions, big and small. So a few of these questions. Why proceed article by article rather than issue by issue? And there are two main reasons there. One is permissions. So academic works wasn't on anyone's radar when CLAG's news articles were originally published, and we don't want to run afoul of copyright restrictions or exceed what the authors originally agreed to regarding their articles. Therefore, we need each author's permission to share their articles via academic works. And without the permission of each author represented in an issue, we can't upload the full issues. We need to be uploading the individual articles. And the second reason is discoverability. Dealing with each article individually improves that discoverability. As I mentioned before, each item is accompanied by a record that provides structured information about what that item is. And in order to make the articles as discoverable as possible in Google and Google Scholar, we need that metadata to be on the article level, not the full issue level. Also, what happens when a policy is problematic? We already knew that some academic works policies needed to be updated. And here I extend my gratitude because the CLAGS News Project drove home the urgent need to revise academic works' policy regarding authors' names. Named change, and we don't want to handle previously published works 
in a way that would dead name authors or discourage participation by authors whose names have changed. We will be reviewing and revising our policy soon and our naming policy will be front and center of those conversations. Next slide. So I'm gonna use another collection in academic works to illustrate something that I hope will excite you. So here are a few articles from early issues of Women's Studies Quarterly. There's Audre Lorde's The Uses of Anger, Women in the High School Curriculum, A Feminist Approach to Sex Education in the High School, and Teaching Lesbian Poetry. So these are articles likely to interest a broad audience. And indeed our download statistics shows that these are among the most downloaded articles in the WSQ collection inside academic works. But, Next slide. There are also items of less obvious interest. So here, for example, is the front matter from one issue and the back matter from another issue of WSQ. These also have good download, download numbers, but why? You know, who knows? And maybe for the 1972 front matter, um, it's the blurb about the clearinghouse on women's studies. And in the 1980 issue, maybe it's the advertisement for a film inspired and narrated by Tilly Olson, or maybe it's the list of authors featured in two special women and education journal issues. We don't know. And it's nothing we would have predicted but clearly there's interest and use of these items. So they themselves are not scholarly works, but they nevertheless have a scholarly value because they help tell the story of the emergence of the field of women's studies. And the same will inevitably be true of Clagg's news articles. Some will interest a wide audience and then some less so, but they all have scholarly value because they help tell the story of Clagg's and LGBTQ studies. We will only learn what's of interest if we put it out there for folks to easily find. Next slide. So I started by saying Clagg's News is where, and now I ask, where is Clagg's News? Right now, a large and growing number of articles live in CUNY academic works, but in not very long, they will take on new life all over the world. Here's a map showing downloads of WSQ articles, and soon we'll have a similarly exciting map of Clagg's News downloads. So that is all from me. And now if we can go to the next slide, I'm pleased to introduce Caitlin Angel, who is um, an, adjunct an adjunct reference librarian here at the Graduate Center and also the coordinator of library instruction at Long Island University in Brooklyn. And she was um, really one of the um, major um, uh, hubs in the wheel that made this happen. Kate was involved um, on so many different levels from outreach to tracking to uploading and much more. And so Kate, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jill. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kate and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Um, it was absolutely my pleasure to participate in the Clags Repository Project. It's been close to two years in the making for me. Um, in June of 2019, I was asked by Sean, who is my former direct supervisor at the Graduate Center, if I'd like to collaborate on this project. And it was essentially a dream library project to collaborate on for me. Queer history is an integral part of my life. And so I began by working most closely with, at this point, but with Sean, Catherine, and Sadie Rain. And we began contacting and locating contact information for all the CLAG's authors that we could. Um, asking them to submit permission forms if they'd like, and then soliciting their permission to add the articles to CUNY Academic Works. Um, and so if you could please go to the next slide, Sean. Okay, just a couple of project acknowledgements. The people that I mentioned I worked closely with, um, Sadie Rain, Hope Gunn, and Catherine Pratt, as they are not speaking today, but they con contributed massive amounts of work to this project. Next slide, please. And here are some statistics about the collection, which we very much hope is a work in progress as we hope to eventually be able to secure more articles to add to the Clagg's collection. But I just counted this morning and we now have 141 articles in the collection, um, all of which are freely and fully downloadable. There are about 90 authors from Clagg's News currently represented. Um, some authors had multiple publications and we have issues ranging from 1992 all the way to 2013. 
Um, we do not have every single issue from these times as we were not able to digitize some of the original newsletters, but the bulk of them have been digitized. And this is just a snippet, this image right here of some of our submissions from 2007. So this is what um, it would look like on the CUNY Academic Works CLAGS page. Um, next please, Sean. Okay, this is um, an early front page of a CLAGS news articles from 1996. And then on the other side is one from 2013. So I just tried to um, illustrate a couple of the different covers in a pretty big range in terms of dates. And then the image on the bottom, um, I found that from one of the more recent issues. I just absolutely love that. It's just an uh, image of some people enjoying themselves at an event called, a uh, CLAGS event called Queer Ganza. So these are some of the treasures from these collections. Um, and next slide, please. Okay, I would also like to say that in terms of people who wrote the articles, there was a very wide variety of authors. Um, a lot were by CUNY faculty and students and staff, but there are also many contributions by people outside of the CUNY system. That includes academics from other institutions, independent scholars, um, community activists, lawyers, artists, journalists, the list goes on and on. Um, and so these here are some screenshots from the PDFs of some of the articles that I uploaded to the collection. Um, Top one is from uh, LGBTQ Women of Color Conference from 2010. Um, so we have many different types of examples of content that was reported on in the collection. Um, these range from letters from the editor in chief to reports on membership, um, fundraising, fellowships, all the important aspects of running a center like CLAGS. Um, and also reports on external events such as queer conferences like the one above. Um, reports on lectures, CLAG sponsored events, such as um, this manifesto by Susan Stryker featured below. Um, next slide, please, Sean. Okay, and so here is a wonderful piece by Sarah Chin, who spoke earlier, um, speaking about a conference, which I very much wish I could have attended on lesbian lives in the 1970s. Um, there is a lot of uh, coverage as Sarah had mentioned on international research at CLAGS. Um, here's an interesting report by Navid Alam um, talking about an anti-homophobia conference that happened in Turkey. And um, there were a lot of reviews that academics had written pertaining to specific CLAGS events. And so at the bottom is Lawrence Lafontaine Strokes um, reviewing LGBTQ Hispanic Caribbean lit event. Next, please. Um, and so I picked on the left-hand side. Um, this is a report from the co-chairs at the time from 1992. Uh, these are Cheryl Clark and Esther Katz. And the photo below um, is a bit blurred, but I just included this. I thought this was especially wonderful to include because this was the very first issue of CLAGS News that we had available to include. And it's from 1992. And this was their first report. And a photo of the two of them was included as well. Um, and on the other side, there's a Kessler lecture, which Clags would host a Kessler lecture where they would invite a different scholar in to speak. And 2002, um, this is an amazing piece by Judith Butler um, called Violence, Mourning, and Politics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, additionally, if anyone on this call or if you know anybody who has uh, published in Clags, we would love if you'd consider submitting your work to the collection. Like I said, this collection is very much a work in progress and we hope to begin to continue to add to it. At this point, I'm happy with the response rate we've gotten. I, I looked through the list and about 50% or so of authors that we contacted were able to upload the permission forms, um, but we'd love to get as much as possible. And we have an email address that you're welcome to get in touch with us if you have any questions about submitting your work. Next slide, please. Okay, that's the end of my piece. Thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce a, my longtime friend, Elvis Bakaitis, and current Graduate Center Interim Head of Reference. Um, thank you so much, Kate. And thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, so my name is Elvis Bakaitis. And next slide, please, Sean. 
Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about an exhibit that we actually created a few, two years ago um, about the Clags archives. So I think there's so much richness in the material that it's really almost hard to get a sense um, until you kind of unfold it visually. Um, so the exhibit, which is due to COVID, still up at the Graduate Center, um, if you peek through the windows, um, it highlighted this really extensive history through all the rich ephemera, conference flyers, and lots of other different type of content. Um, so the exhibit title, Thousands of Ghostly Sheaves, was inspired by a quote from Adrian Rich, um, who gave a Kessler le lecture in 2007. Um, and her quote was, the threads that grew into the texture of what is now known as queer studies are thousands of ghostly sheaves, leaflets, letters, pamphlets, mimeographed bibliographies, little magazines. So it's all these sort of tiny components that Kate so wonderfully just illustrated that really create the Clags archives. Next slide. Um, so I wanted to just speak a little bit about LGBT CUNY um, and mention a couple of really excellent upcoming events. Um, but I think something that's not noted as much as perhaps it could be is that CUNY arguably has the largest population of queer identified college students in the entire New York City area, probably within the entire metro area. Um, this is a survey question that's not typically included on surveys to college students. But when you start to think about the amount of enrollments that we have locally, CUNY really stands out just for its sheer size. So with 25 different campuses, it's almost a quarter of a million students that are enrolled at CUNY at any given time, which is huge. So whatever percentage of students you think may be queer or not queer, um, it's just really a mammoth amount of queer students that are impacted, um, and especially by CLAGS as well. So next slide. Um, so coming up is a really great event. Um, so the LGBTQ Hub is a resource that will have events, resources for queer students and faculty, access to name and gender ch um, change forms. And so on April 20th, there'll be sort of an unveiling of this um, new resource for the entire community, community, community and beyond. Um, so I really encourage everyone to attend. Um, and it's organized by the LGBTQ Council. So if you have any questions about issues regarding queer students at CUNY, this is a great place to go. Next slide. So on April 14th, um, a completely different event, but something really of interest is a trans-led um, student town hall. So for queer students at CUNY, there's a lot of issues that come up, and I think this is a great way for students to really have a chance to speak back and share what they perceive to be the issues going on. So April 14th, I'll drop those links in the chat. And please think about attending. And next slide, I'll turn it back over to Sean. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elvis. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'm going to spotlight myself. Uh, so I just wanted to also plug an uh, event that's happening next week um, with CLAGS. We're co-sponsoring it with the Lesbian History Archives, with Sinister Wisdom, with NYU Libraries. Um, and it's going to be a promotion of a new book called Mounds of Rain, as we're talking about scholarship and historic scholarship. This book, this collection is amazing because the author, Brianna Simone Jones, actually got permissions to reprint or first print material from uh, Black lesbian greats. I mean, I can't even list the, list the list of names, but we will hear from Jewel Gomez, Cheryl Clark, Lisa Seymour, Sharon Bridgeforth, Cassandra Grant, and then me too, alongside Susanna Morris, who will be like too wistful, um, impressed upon, you know, not so important Black lesbians who get to talk to those women. As, but I, I definitely recommend the book and also coming to the event where we're gonna talk about it. Speaking of talking about things, we're so surprised. We thought we were going to like run right into three o'clock and we have all this time. So I do want to open up the room for questions. So I'm actually going to stop sharing. We didn't put this in webinar form on purpose because, and I'm going to stop spotlighting myself because we wanted to have everyone talk to each other. So create your screen and gallery view, turn on your camera if you're feeling open to your face right now. I know I should have given you advance warning. You could have had time to like run into the mirror and take a, take a peek. Um, but we do wanna ask questions and maybe I can 
start us off because um, I do I am curious we have Sarah Chen and Justin Brown here and I'm thinking that I'd like to ask them questions about the impact of the CLAGS archive in the repository and really how they think well let me let me actually just ask the question instead of I wrote it down uh, and the question is Sarah or Justin what do you anticipate the impact of the work of CLAGS and its possible use in classrooms or as it relates to teaching and learning, whether this is at CUNY or beyond. And I'll leave you two to think that through. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it, it is a little terrifying for me to think that CLAGS is 30 years old um, because it was founded when I was in graduate school. Um, but I think um, as a repository of information about sort of the vibrancy of queer scholarly and artistic life, the, I mean, Clags News is just an invaluable resource. Um, I don't know if other people have this experience, but certainly among my students, they'll be like, oh, well, back in the day, you know, no one came out and it was, you know, really terrible and nothing was happening. And I'm like, no lots of things were happening. Uh, there was a huge way, you know, array of events and ideas and books and people. Um, and I think that having CLAGS News available electronically is just going to make the history of queer thought, uh, philosophy, art, writing available to everyone and easily accessible in the classroom, right? I mean, so many of us now are using multimedia resources in the classroom and to be able to just click and bring something up on a screen, I think is gonna be really, really useful. Thanks, Sarah. I'm, I'm also curious for Justin, if you think that with this new um, opportunity for uh, scholarship to be so readily accessible because right now we can really just roll things in through CLAGS into the academic works repository. If you think that it may shift how you consider programming and projects going forward within CLAGS today. I, I do. I, I think that, um, you know, as you've mentioned, and it's been wonderfully highlighted here. I think in many ways, sometimes um, the kind of events and programming is, uh, is very centered, right, in what we do and is core to what we do. But I think along with that, the archival aspect of, of creating that um, information of legacy for access is so critically important. I think that given also the push of the direction in terms of um, open access resources, um, a larger push within the institution itself, making sure and in the fields, making sure that these types of of uh, um, types of information are at the fingertips and available for people um, because you know we see and approach our programming really as an educational opportunity that maybe in some ways has um, historically been confined to in other disciplines and areas to the kind of ivory tower notion of higher education but um, I think we've really strived um, throughout its its um, development and history to become really an educational space that's open and accessible to everyone, right? And um, as it should be, and as I, I believe personally, as it um, always should have been, right? In terms of, of what we aim to do. And um, so I think it will certainly help provide us um, an additional avenue through which to, how, to think about how do we begin to interweave and um, reconceptualize programming, especially in the age of where we are today, of, you know, whether by, you know, unfortunately by somewhat of a, a forced situation to a, a distance kind of learning virtual world um, due to the pandemic, um, but that's now created another avenue that we've been able to capture this. And so I think that um, it only will continue to augment and allow for us to rethink what we do in, a, in, a, in some other purposeful ways. Um, and I, I, I also agree, I also share um, in the notion and sentiments that um, as we also continue to think about broadening our own educational 
resources that we use and the types of resources that we use, that this is so critical um, because it's a resource that can be used as a, as a teaching tool um, in these classrooms and spaces that oftentimes we're kind of placed into the idea of, of only looking at specific types of academic pieces in writing, right? Or, uh, or only particular types of textbooks or particular pieces of, of, of material to use to kind of um, as, as, that, as a tool as we move forward. And so I think as a dis interdisciplinary field, as education continues to change and evolve overall, um, I, and LGBTQ studies um, and its multitude of intersections continues to grow. I think that um, this dovetails and is clearly um, cannot be separated out from our own programming and how those avenues are the ways that will we'll move forward and how teaching, I think, evolves and changes for the future. Thanks, Justin. I also um, wanted to ask the librarian something because I realized I may have opened a door that I, that I need to close back. First, I'm going to ask Jill about scope and then I'm going to ask Kate about highlights. Um, so when I was at the Graduate Center, I had the opportunity to put my works into academic works. And I love to tell the story when we were promoting it to faculty, like put, input your stuff because it's amazing. They're like, what's the big deal? And I, one um, anecdote that I have is I was able to take an article, I forget which one it was. Um, no, it was in there and it was found somewhere in London. They were looking for participants for a conference. It was for the um, LGBT International Archives Conference, um, LGBT Alms, which we actually hosted at CLAGS um, prior. And so they were holding it in London and they asked me to keynote and they only even knew who I was because my work was in academic works success right like for me personally but also for the conference and like all of the networking that happened after that so my question is what is the scope of this collection is it only clags news or is it anything that is clags generated for example when i was librarian i had people emailing me saying i'm an alum can i put my stuff in the repository is the clags news collection a way in for scholars to put material into academic works through a CLAGS pipeline, or are we containing it in some way? And how are you making that scope decision? That's for Jill. So Sean, now that now that you've invited me to unmic myself, um, I hope it's okay that I realize I have an answer, an echo, and an anecdote to share. Um, so I'm saying those out loud in hopes I'll remember all three. So um, the answer is right. I, I put a comment in the um, in the chat pointing out something that's, you know, it's a little library in detail that if you look at the URL, it's academicworks.qne.edu slash Clags pubs. It's not slash Clags news. And that's for a reason that there are um, um, all sorts of things that we would welcome into that collection in academic works. And it could be things like other publications from Clags, um, um, whether that is conference proceedings or, um, or an exhibit or a recording of an event, all sorts of things related to the intellectual output of CLAGS would be absolutely welcome. And then the question of the individual author's own scholarship is, um, is a slightly different question. And I don't want to be exclusionary, but I think the answer is, um, it depends on whether it was like work done for CLAGS or work that is their own individual academic scholarship. Um, and if it's for CLAGS, that it would be totally welcome um, in that CLAGS section. And for example, if I were to show the CLACLS um, um, section of academic works, there are CLACLS reports there written by a GC faculty member. And so, um, they, but they are there under CLACLS because it was a report produced for CLACLS. Um, and but if it's something that is simply somebody's own personal academic research, then I think the more appropriate place, if they're a CUNY affiliate, whether student or faculty member, is to um, upload to the appropriate campus section 
of the repository, the campus where they're based. Um, and um, if they're somewhere else, chances are that wherever that somewhere else is also has a repository for faculty and student scholarship. And then that might be the best place to put the works that are not directly tied to the to CLAG's activities. Um, but I also, the echo that I wanted to mention is actually echoing something Sean told me once. Um, Sean, you're, you've been on the archives committee of CLAG's for a long time, right? And, and I remember you telling me about having people reach out to you seeking old copies of CLAG's news and they weren't even digitized yet. Um, and so it's, you know, making, making them public is of course an amazing ultimate goal, but even, even intermediate to that, there was the need to digitize them so they could be shared with the people who reached out to you. But I was also just thinking that that requires people to know that they exist and to have the courage to reach out to a stranger. And both of those things are pretty big hurdles. Um, and so I'm so thrilled that Academic Works will help people know that CLAG's, CLAG News, and these individual articles exist, and then also take away that hurdle of needing to do something a little bit scary, reaching out, reaching out to a stranger and asking for something. something. Um, and then I also just wanted to share a little anecdote, which is um, I, sent an email the other day, got an auto response from the, um, from the person who is not at CUNY. Um, and in her email signature, there was a quote from Audre Lorde and she linked to the article in Academic Works. Now, I happen to know this librarian, does she have, did, did I ever tell her Academic Works existed? No, did I ever tell her Women's Studies Quarterly was in Academic Works? No, did I ever tell her that particular article was in Academic Works? No, she found it, the piece moved her and she quoted it and linked to it um, because she could. And um, so I feel like, that opens like my mind to the possibilities of what people could do with the CLAG's news articles. And, and so now I dream one day of seeing in somebody's email signature, a quote from a CLAG's news article linking directly to the full article. I was gonna chat, we can all do it now. We can just go in there, find our favorite one and then <laughs> take it and put it in our signatures. Um, so I wanted to open it up to the room. I did have a question for Kate um, and I see a qual follow-up question for Marianne. Um, Kate, how do you feel? Do you want to answer? Yeah, my question was, Kate, yeah, it was a quick one. And it was, were there any surprises or interesting content you found in the newsletters? There were a lot of, there were a lot, was a lot of interesting content in the newsletters. Um, as part of my work uploading the each document to Academic Works, I needed to look through the article so that I could identify various keywords and whatnot. So I was really able to take a close look and it was really fascinating also for me, especially to be, read the articles of what was going on in the nineties, um, very early two thousands, because I, I graduated from college in 06. So before that I wasn't, before my freshman year of college, I didn't know that much about queer studies and queer history in New York. And so to me, that was very personally compelling. Um, I also thought, interestingly, there were multiple pieces about queer um, medieval conferences and scholarship, which is something I not didn't know much about, um, but one by uh, called What's Medieval Got to Do It by Carolyn Dinshaw, and then one about a specific uh, queer Middle Ages conference at, at the Graduate Center in 99 uh, by Francesca Sotman. Um, and it was also fun to read works written by CUNY students one that stood out in particular was one from 2009 by uh, Jesse Baker, who wrote about how in 09, um, Brooklyn College became the first CUNY school to offer undergrads uh, a minor in LGBTQ studies. So I could really talk about them all day. I mean, it was especially, it was exciting also. I saw a couple publications by professors I knew at my undergrad. Um, they definitely didn't know who I was, I knew who they were, but it was exciting, it was fun to be able to reach out to them too. And they both contributed their works to the collection as well. So that was uh, affirming. I was just gonna put in the Jesse Baker article into the chat because I found it while you talked about it. So I wanted to um, look at Marianne's question um, and I probably spelled Baker's, um, uh, Elvis, wants to chime in and maybe Elvis, you can bring in Marianne's question. Um, you can also help respond to the scope note and whether there's 
a finding aid for this or how you anticipate people seeing it as a whole collection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you, Marianne. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of follow up on Kate's thought um, because again, working on the exhibit with Catherine Pratt, um, we really got this sort of deep dive into the Clive's archive. Um, and I think the 2009 Brooklyn College LGBTQ studies minor is such an important um, aspect of kind of CUNY's own queer history. Um, there was a lot of advocacy and actual activism from faculty for that to even happen. So I just think it's such a big um, kind of stride for CUNY. And I think um, positioning CUNY within the world of queer studies is also super important. Um, Matt Brim has written a lot about kind of CUNY students and working with them and realizing all the class issues that actually come up. So in his book, Poor Queer Studies, he's kind of repositioning, you know, where is the value of CUNY students in this world and landscape? And I think just again, given the size and scope of CUNY, um, you really kind of get a different sense of that. So all of that is very visible in a very minute way um, within the archive, as well as conferences on queer disability studies, trans studies, you start seeing names, then five years later, you're, they're famous, but they weren't famous in Clag's News, right? So it's kind of a fun little landscape of sort of like the family and friends of queer studies that you feel that you have. And I think that's what's really great about it. Um, so as to Marianne's question, I might actually pivot back that to Jill because it looks like you're already answering this. Um, but yes, Marianne was asking about the finding aid aspect. And I think it's a great resource for educators, definitely, because it's a real window into the specific CUNY world of queer studies. Um, but Jill, do you want to follow up um, at all about that findability portion? Um, right, so I, I was very aware that what I put into the chat was a partial answer that um, you can, if you want, search just within that section in academic works. Um, and because of the work Kate did pulling out keywords, um, it helps um, it helps yield good results for the searches. Um, but I wonder if Sean might know, does, does CLAGS in the CLAGS archives have finding aids? And I don't know the answer to that. Broadly speaking, no. There are different components of the CLAGS archive and some of them do have some um, scope notes. I wouldn't go as detailed as to say that they're finding aids through say folder folder or item level because we don't have it organized as such. Um, it's in some ways organized by the institution's use of it. So by year, not necessarily by format, but yet we have collections that are in some ways by format. Um, but what is interesting about the CLAGS News collection in academic works is it really is listed as a table of contents in that you have title and author going through and it, with it's in some ways a small enough um, comp, you know composite of material that you can just scroll down through the chapter list or the item list and that is if you print it out it is what a finding aid would look like because there is the scope note at the top and then there are the individual contributions going down um, so you could in some ways just print out the main page there's only two pages right now i think as of right now it would only get to as much as two to three because i think the total number of materials was like one 169 authors and maybe that was like 250 pieces i'm not exactly sure i don't have the numbers exact but um that's what i would recommend to do is to really just look through the chap the item list and then click around as you see it but there wouldn't be a formal finding aid in fact clax i i almost feel like i can't be a board chair without saying that CLAGS does need funding for these projects. Um, thankfully, the Graduate Center Library offered its labor um, of librarians and librarians like this, and the repository exists. Um, but we didn't have the capacity to process the collections the way that we would like to. So it would be great if one day we had an item level or folder level uh, archival collection where we could have finding aids, but we're not there yet. So I will definitely put a link to the chat if you wanted to help support CLAGS. Um, and its work going forward, because it, I think we would definitely love to do this with all of the, the all of the archive, not just the single components. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Yanis asked, how did we differ in creating this archive from standard established practices or categories, if there's any innovative techniques and steps? Um, I'm thinking the question, Yanis, if you wanted to elaborate, I'm not sure, but is focused on the collection within academic works and its unique compartments is that what you want to know i don't know if yanis wants to 
Well, I can, I can respond to what I think the question is asking um, and Jill can jump in, which is a uh, part of why Jill uh, showcased the Women's Studies Quarterly and some other larger um, collections that were institutionally based is because the Academic Works Repository, like most repositories, really is functioning as a repository of individual scholarship. Most of what's in there are dissertations from folks who are graduating from the Graduate Center. And so we have like a whole dissertation section. Then it's organized by uh, institutions. So you have Brooklyn College, Graduate Center, Queens, et cetera, and then the faculty within those and the faculty scholarship. So to have a special section that's just for an institution or a center or an institute is a unique way to use the repository while still acknowledging that it's meant to be a uh, scholarship and not say a repository of learning objects, although there are learning objects in there. Um, so, but it's, it, we had to think through, I think the main component that we thought through was the um, item level by author and not the issue level, uh, because that made a difference in how we were organizing it and how it would look visually to people who wanted to access it. But maybe Jill wants to say a little bit more. Sean, you said so much of, of what I was thinking, um, right? And I was thinking also about how there are all of these authors who um, are not at CUNY. And so, right, ordinarily they wouldn't, their work wouldn't qualify for inclusion in CUNY academic works, which is for the CUNY community, but because it was for a publication associated with a CUNY um, institute, um, therefore their work did, did warrant inclusion. And so, right, it's just unusual for us to be reaching out beyond the CUNY community. Um, but it's wonderful what we've been able to pull in. Um, and then I was also thinking something we haven't done yet, but we are open to doing if, if, um, if it is necessary or if the author wishes, um, is um, redaction. And so in the repository, there are very few instances of redaction. Sometimes we have it on dissertations if there were signatures from advisors and we don't necessarily want to make signatures public. That's kind of private information. Um, and um, I think those are the only instances of redaction that we have. Um, but if there is a situation in which somebody's name changed, we could put it um, in the repository using their current name and redact their non-current name in the PDF itself. Um, so that was, that was a possibility we came up with that would be a um, um, definitely a departure um, because ordinarily we think about the consistency of the scholarly record, but there are there are some needs that um, um, that supersede questions of of. Um, sort of shallowly looked at um, consistency in the question of using somebody's actual current name and not their dead name is, is one of those instances. Um, and also, if we weren't able to offer something like that, it's possible those works would never be made public and so much better to make them public than not make, make them public. Um, and so we should, we need to be, we need, really need to be mindful of names. And on that note, thank you so much to all of our speakers today and congratulations to us all as a community for getting this work out there into the world in every place where an internet connection is available. People can now have access to this queer scholarship. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, it has been recorded so Elvis will figure out how to get it out to folks so that you can share and refer. And we really appreciate you and thank you to everyone at the Graduate Center Library, our CLAG's executive directors for all of their hard work. So amazing. What an amazing community to be a part of. Go to your three o'clock meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.